Welcome to the Earthworks Podcast, where our team will share the jargon of carbon from many of our turf friends from the past 30 years. Hi, everybody. Kevin Hicks with Earthworks. Um, I wanted to uh, take a minute to introduce my guest today on the podcast, um, uh, Gina Rizzi with Radius Sports. Uh, Gina and I had a great conversation about golf, the environment, BMPs, um, communication, how we can communicate within our, our community as to, as to the benefits of, of golf. Um, obviously at Earthworks, we're, we're focused on uh, creating a better environment for our turf, but also, also a better environment for our community. Uh, we know that, that reducing inputs is, is something that is, is a side benefit of, of creating balanced soils. Um, and, and everything we do is kind of focused on that, that creating a healthy environment to then create healthy turf. Um, we talked, we talked about that. We talked about kind of her role as, as a president of her, her two companies and what she sees on the horizon, but also kind of the, the positives out of the industry and also things we can, we can work on. Um, I hope you enjoy it. And uh, if, if you're enjoying these podcasts, make sure that you subscribe so that you get our updates on a weekly basis. Also subscribe on the YouTube channel. Uh, we've got lots and lots of content there that, that uh, is available free for consumption whenever you, whenever you uh, have an interest in it. So uh, with that, Miss Gina Rizzi. Hi again, everybody. This is Kevin Hicks with Earthworks. I am really excited to... Uh, share an hour with Gina Rizzi from Radius Sports, among other things. Gina, thanks so much for, for agreeing to talk with me today. Yeah, I love it. Happy to talk with you today, Kevin. Yeah, I think, I think it's going to be fun. I, I've got a, we, we talked on Friday and I've got a bunch of good questions and, and things and, and have followed your work for a long time. I'm kind of excited to see, you know, what's, what's on the horizon for you and your firm and, and, uh, um, kind of how it affects and impacts us in golf and other sports for that matter. So thanks again for, uh, for joining us. This will be great. Um, so I did a little research before we got on the phone on Friday and uh, it, it seems you're not afraid of education. And we actually talked a little bit about that uh, just before we got on the air here. Uh, you have a BA from Michigan state in advertising, an MBA in finance and marketing from the university of Notre Dame. And then you've also got a certificate in sustainable energy management from the Presidio Grad School. So that's all kind of culminated in what you're doing now. So um, in addition to, I guess, early on, it must have been after college, you were the, devel the uh, director of business development and global account manager for Avis Budget Group. Yep. Right. Okay. And then... Um, co-founder and principal with Impact 360 Sports. And I, I think if we talked about it, it that, that kind of evolved into what you're doing now. Is that, is that correct? Yes, that was a joint venture for about a year and a half, two years that um, when that ended, I founded Radius Sports Group. Okay, and Radius Sports, is uh, that, that started in 2017, is that right? Four years ago, yeah. Okay, 2017, and then uh, alongside of that, you're also the president of Arcus Marketing Group, correct? Yeah, 10 and a half years now. So oh, okay, so, so break that down. So what do the two do? Um, you told me, but I'd love the audience to kind of, kind of hear how, that, how that's related and how they're different. Yes, so, um, so Arcus, I founded Arcus um, almost. It'll be 11 years in October, 11 years ago, that um, an Arcus is, is focused on the key areas around um, sports marketing, corporate social responsibility, which includes sustainability on the social and environmental side, and then um, business to business marketing uh, around sports activation or sports marketing activation and um, media optimization. So those are the four core areas for Arcus. And we work mainly with Fortune 500 companies. Um, some of our clients um, either currently or have been, um, Avis actually, where I used to work, um, yeah. Mazda, PepsiCo, um, Quite a few, you know, different larger companies, and the range of things that we do with those organizations is varies between those four key areas. And basically, what happened was um, 
a few years, several years into working um, with my company with Arcus and, and growing and building the business, um, we started seeing a trend of more um, sports marketing activation um, that was focused around uh, things like sustainability, employee engagement, community uh, giving and community involvement. And um, it, it was evolving to the point where companies that were doing sponsorships didn't want to just put a naming rights on a building um, and and pay for that they instead wanted something more meaningful out of their sponsorships and that um, really started to spill more into the sustainability world um, keeping in mind at the same time um, when after the recession which is around the time i founded arcus the um, a lot of companies were getting more and more into lean manufacturing, Six, Six Sigma processes, focusing on sustainable initiatives and starting to communicate a little bit more around those. So um, as we started seeing these trends, um, I, we went into a joint venture um, in golf. We were already doing a lot of work in motorsports um, and having some of that crossover. But we went into a joint venture in golf that was around sustainability of golf, did the first corporate social responsibility report for the Olympic Club in San Francisco, which was, as far as I know, the first CSR report in golf anywhere. Um, but I definitely know for North America. Um, which is really ahead of its time. Pat Finlan was the GM there at the time. Right. And um, really that was about sharing the story of the Olympic Club around its sustainability initiatives. Um, when that joint venture ended, I uh, created Arcus or Radius as a subsidiary of Arcus. And um, since then, we've been focused on um, working on the golf maintenance side or the turf side around BMP development, CSR reports, um, some impact reports um, for states, and then also the social sustainability side, um, working with the PJ of America and others. And that has grown a lot over the last couple of years uh, around uh, diversity and inclusion initiatives and efforts, um, community engagement, employee engagement, and things like that. So, um, so it's been a, a lot of um, momentum over the last several years. And um, that's really kind of how they, the radius evolves, um, but how they play together is Radius, um, one of the differentiators in working with us when we do anything in, in the golf world around sustainable initiatives, um, we utilize the back-end services of Arcus for marketing and communication. So um, that really differentiates the output. So for example, we've done seven state BMP documents or manuals, and we utilize Arcus resources like our designers from the Arcus side, like communications and PR folks from the Arcus side to help with um, those initiatives and the rollout of those. So it makes okay. really high-end, uh, tangible, professional pieces that are really uh, easy to read and use, and they're geared toward all stakeholders. Um, so this has been a little bit different approach from things like a BMP manual in the past, which has a little bit more of an academic feel traditionally, sure. um, and it fits much more with kind of the current way that things are being communicated out there, especially when you're factoring in different stakeholders. So, um, so yeah, so it's that back end services of, mm -hmm. of marketing and communications that we utilize the resources of Arcus to implement through radius. Okay. Okay. Well, that makes sense. And I, I, I have BMPs on my list of things that I wanted to talk about. So that's actually a pretty good segue for the next, uh, yeah. the next little piece, but um, and you said seven states you were you, you worked with on on their BMP. I know Colorado. I I now know Connecticut, right? Yep. yep. Uh, Connecticut, Texas. Texas, Hawaii, Wisconsin, Oklahoma. Okay. Uh, I think that's seven. That's okay. Seven. Yep. Yep. So, um, from your perspective, and, and and I haven't had a chance to look at any of the documents you guys have created, but from from your perspective. Um, I was on. I was a committee chair for the state of Idaho for the for the BMP. We worked with Ken Benoit, who you know, um, and we basically used the template that was was produced by GCSA and and kind of modified a little bit. But um, where do we go next with that? 
has. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's some great pathways to go with that. So, I mean, the, you know, the GCSAA um, goals are for this, the facilities to develop and yep. adopt um, BMP guides and to be implementing those at facilities. So, of course, that is a natural um, route to go with it. And it's important and it makes sense. Um, it's important, of course, um, just from a, you know, following best management practices, there's a lot of work that has gone into these guides and the state guides are so well done. And the original national template was fantastic. So um, really kind of building off of those to customize to an individual facility is a natural path. Um, beyond that, you know, even with just the state guides, I would love to see more um, states, and I'm starting to see this, which is really cool, um, really utilize the contents of their guide from a communications perspective and an advocacy perspective right. as well. Um, so, for example, I know Hawaii does this. I know Colorado is about to start with this, and that is hot off the press from a conversation this morning. Um, the they're, they're in their um, state association newsletters or magazines um, pulling and putting together articles that are driven out from the BMP manuals, um, the state manuals, to kind of touch on, say, during airification season, you know, what is airification? Why do we do it? What are the best management practices around it? What are the benefits um, for the course? You know, what are the benefits for the community even around it? Does it help, you know, that it helps reduce water use, um, that it helps with filtration, you know, that like the various benefits incorporating those into an article um, or into a communications piece. Uh, there's channels like that. And I mean, I, I could delve into a whole bunch of different yeah. Ways that I'm gonna pause there because uh, I don't want to give you too much. You might have a, a different. So, one. so when you say associations, are you talking golf associations more? Yeah. yeah. So, like a state golf association. Right. Okay. Um, or the PGA section for a state. So mm -hmm. in Hawaii, that example, the PGA section puts out a newsletter. Uh, I think it's quarterly, and they have asked the association multiple times to help provide articles for that newsletter. So um, that goes out. I would love to see, though, even more mainstream coverage, you know, right. so there's opportunities in that vein, too, to really use the content. There's so much content. I was just going to pull this out earlier, this Colorado guide. Um, there's so much content in this guide. It's 100 and 50 pages of really good stuff that superintendents are doing every day um, out on their courses. And um, it's very relevant to some of the things that are important out there in the world to a lot of different stakeholders. So, so we'll have a variety of turf managers listening to this, but for the golf course superintendent specifically, or, or the sports turf for that matter, who outside of the golf community who do you feel would be the most important to impact with this information? City council, schools. I mean, where, where you know, I've got my own ideas, but you've you've worked on this a, a lot more intently and 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 longer than I have. So so where is the best impact for for all the work that's been put into these state by state? Yeah. So I, I would take two levels. I would say on the um, legislative or I'm going to combine these and I guess technically they're separate, but legislative and regulatory levels sure. uh, is one. And then I would say um, regulatory from a local perspective would be the secondary one. Um, and then I, even the, I add a third, like at a club in the community, um, the members, it's, of the club itself. I think I mean, if it's a public course, then the community, um, the, the, okay. And then the reason why I break it down. So advocacy national golf day, of course, um, it's important to be talking about these guys. Right. We've been, I go every year. Um, I usually set up meetings with, uh, representative senators or representative offices for any state in which I do business in any state in which there's a partnership. Um, that Radius has where we do business, I will meet 
um, with someone from one of those offices. And I've been talking about BMPs now for several years, um, talk, whether it's they're coming out or whether it's they are out and, um, and talking about what they mean, um, why it's important for them to be aware of them. Of, of BMPs, why it's important for them to be aware that the golf courses within their state are taking part in this initiative and how they're getting in front of um, potential concerns. Um, there's and, and being proactive around uh, environmental stewardship. And so that's important, the, that advocacy level, also from a regulatory perspective, you know, whether it's legislation that's coming down um, from a national level or state level, um, like we had you know, a lot of conversations around WOTUS several years back right. uh, at National Golf Day, but also at State Golf Day. Not every state does that, but some do. Um, that's also important. And so regulations um, in regards to kind of more sweeping stuff on a state level, but also um, there could be city stuff. So that's where we get into that city level. And if, if um, a superintendent is going to get a permit to do some work on their course, um, it, rather than just going in and requesting or calling or submitting something online, it would be um, really a good practice to have a face-to-face -face meeting with someone to bring in something like this. Right. Right. Um, and I don't know that that's being done. Um, I know I know a couple courses that we've worked with um, have done that kind of thing. Have had city council meetings, you know, where they've shared that, and that's been great. Um, but the other thing I would say with the community or members is really important because the out, yeah, I see it all the time. You know, the people don't necessarily realize all of the hats that a superintendent wears and all of the things that they're doing every single day um, to be good environmental stewards. So um, to share this kind of stuff and be communicating it in a way that makes sense and resonates um, for those stakeholders too, it's important. So I'd say that. Yeah, to me, it introduces a level of professionalism that may not be assumed, right? Yeah. Right. And preparedness for that matter. You know, hey, these are the things that we're doing on a daily basis to try to protect our community, our portion of the community. Yep. Um, and, you know, one of the things I was thinking about this weekend is, and I've, and I've talked to groups about this in the past, but the unfortunate position we tend to find ourselves in in this industry is defensive. Yeah. And, and these documents to me are a great offensive tool that we can get out ahead and uh, and and preach and yeah. and really spread the word that you know we're 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 a professional group we're prepared we know what we're doing and we always have environmental concerns in the forefront of our minds as we go about our daily our daily operations yes um, yeah, definitely um I, I, I get really frustrated with, and I was a superintendent for a long time, and and you know the same thing. You, you get so busy with your day to day stuff that you don't, you, you know, you don't have a time set aside for advocacy. But um, to me, making changes in how we operate our businesses is a whole lot easier to do voluntarily than legislatively. If we're legislated into restrictions. Um, you know, I know there's something going on in Portland, Maine right now, as far as some new pesticide restrictions, and there's been no public input, even though that state's got this document in place. And, and, you know, sometimes groups don't want to be confused with the facts. But at the same time, if you've, if you've established a line of communication and a relationship with the people, even if it's a, a city council, you know, at least then you'll have a seat at the table when the decisions are being made. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, um, I know in Hawaii, uh, they have run into some things around pesticide use. And um, one of the courses on Maui, yeah. um, I participated in a city council meeting that was like seven hours long, um, <laughs> sharing testimony, you know, around um, the facts around it. From my perspective, I mean, I was there talking about the BMPs. Um, but we, there were some professors on, you know, talking about the, the levels of use and, you know, the types of products being used and, you know, just really trying to educate on, it's very 
easy for people to make assumptions and kind of jump on a bandwagon about something. So like right. really educating on you know, what are the facts. And the thing about the BMP document is it, it shows that pro those proactive measures um, because it is something that is happening, existing and being done already on so many courses out there mm -hmm. uh, following, you know, in that case, um, IPM practices. So um, there's, there's a lot that, that can be done in being proactive. There was something you, you and I had talked about the other day. You know, I, I've seen like the last couple of years, just such a wave of press coverage around these green roofs in urban environments. Right. You know, I love it. I think it's awesome. Um, and it's really important for a city with, you know, all the concrete and the structures and um, pollution in cities. Um, the green roofs have such a great benefit. But I see I see all these articles out there that are in really kind of like one was I saw recently was in Fast Company magazine, you know, I think USA Today, I saw an article and that's all this kind of press that's happening around the benefits of green roofs and it's stuff like you know tackling air pollution um, filtering <laughs> runoff providing, yeah, providing pollinator <laughs> habitats um, providing even wildlife habitats and um, helping things around mental health and dementia and all this stuff and I'm just like ah this needs these need to be golf course articles right. So um, there's a lot more that we can be doing to share the positive stories. Yeah, and I, and I think too many times, I know I ran into this when I was in Arizona years ago, I, I, a, a writer that was not friendly to, a, a, a newspaper writer that was not friendly to the golf industry at all, had caught wind of one of my club reports that I had written and somehow got a hold of a copy of it and it it just blew up and so you you only need to have that happen once or twice and you can you tend to pull back a little bit and, and not be willing to share but boy this is a time when we really need to you know whether it's through a spokesperson like yourself or or, or i think the best place to do it is within your community and and you know who better than the golf course superintendent to really spread the word of what they're what they're doing yeah, yeah, it, and it do, it does help to have like a third party um, as well, you know, like sure. kind of in my case, sustainability um, perspective. That's more of a generalist kind of sustainability um, expert, and uh, it does help to have that. Um, but yeah, su uh, superintendents, um, superintendents, they are very humble. Um, and kind of shy away from the spotlight often, not everybody, but like in general, there's quite a few who do. So understood, um, but definitely like being aware of the benefits of the things um, that they're doing and being able to speak to those benefits when needed um, makes a big difference. Sure. And I think that, uh, you know, a, a good bridge to the community that comes to mind is the first green program oh, you know, yeah. where, where it's, it's showing our passion for the industry to a group that will be sitting on city council within, you know, with it easily within a generation and, and certainly going to affect their parents as well. Absolutely. I mean, there's so many great, I love the first green program. Love it. Uh, yeah. There's so many great aspects to that. Um, from, and everywhere from, I mean, uh, the obvious educational perspective around STEM um, education, but, um, but getting kids and adults, the schools and their parents more familiar, familiar with the benefits of a golf course and sure. all the great benefits that it provides, um, not to mention the whole, you know, like reaching into communities where um, there's a there's a lot of um, in some cases, diversity that of kids getting on the course that maybe would have never been exposed to a course before. Right, right their school program so um there that's like a, a completely different level of benefit too for the future there's there's so many benefits to that program and you know selfishly i always looked at it as a as a great pipeline for for future employees too you know because like you said a lot of a lot of kids just have never been exposed to the game or the opportunities and and that's certainly you know for most superintendents that's probably the uh, the selfish motivation behind it but but I think the, to me, the work that, that you can show a group of students and the teachers is yeah. invaluable. Um, and, and just 
will certainly pay off down the road. Yeah, yeah, I think that the employment pipeline is a is a really good thing um, for sure. You know, um, that kind of fits within. You know, I probably know Tyler Bloom and the work that he's sure. doing yep. around apprenticeship programs and everything. I mean, that kind of, and I know he's worked on some things with STEM too, and that that is like the precursor to say an apprenticeship program. And so there's just like a whole chain of um, benefit and kind of ways that uh, like programs like the first green can branch out and really help the community and the industry itself. Yeah, agreed. Okay, so this was a, a conversation we had on Friday that that can be a little uncomfortable, I think at times, but um, you know, here we are as the GCSA working towards, um, you know, ratifying these documents and doing all the work and, and, but the partnerships and the strength and partnerships within the golf industry, it, it seems like a lot of times we're missing the, that opportunity. So t- talk about that. What, how, how do we bridge those gaps? You know, you've got the PGA of America, you've got the CMAA, you've got certainly the, the, the state golf associations, like you mentioned earlier. I mean, you've got all of these high powered, influential, connected groups, probably more so than, than our group. Um, and yet we're not talking all that often. USGA is another one. Why, what, why are we not talking more and how do we bridge that? Yeah, such a challenge. Um, so why? Yeah, uh, you know what I think? I think that this is my personal view. I think there's two main reasons. One is um, oftentimes in business, you know, we get a myopic view of what we're doing and what we need to accomplish, and everyone has only so much time, and you need to get it done. And um, and so you're not thinking strategically, you know, and spending the time on things for the long run. Um, sure. So I think that's one kind of bigger, higher level um, matter. The other one I think is related to, you've got associations that um, kind of compete a little bit uh, in some sense, in some sen- in some ways. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the associations like the USGA, the PGA of America, the PGA Tour, um, they're, the LPGA, you know, they're competing for sponsor dollars. Um, they're competing for network uh, mm-hmm. exposure. And so there's kind of that level. Um, the GCSAA, of course, doesn't put on like big tournaments and stuff like that, but also is competing for partners and sponsors for its uh, GIS, for the EF, the EFG, which operates separately, but still related. Um, so, and funding grants and things like that. So you've got um, a certain level of competition. What I've noticed, you know, in the last six years that I've really been honed in and working more closely with the golf industry is that um, that's shifting a little bit. I think that, you know, we're, it, I know it's shifting. So for example, um, you know, it's, it is great that the USGA um, is a significant partner or was a significant partner on the state documents and, you know, helping to fund the grant programs um, for the states. The PGA Tour, I know, also contributed to that. So that's wonderful. Um, I know that, uh, that, you know, potentially there could be, hopefully there, that will continue as the facility, um, facility rollout continues to happen. Um, but it's, it's still not, um, you still don't see kind of the interplay like on an, on a regular basis, got the green section, um, does some work with individual courses, um, there's some research that happens, you know, that's great, but we don't see like a real hand in hand on that. Um, we're starting to see a little bit more coverage around uh, the work that agronomists and superintendents are doing in preparation for, say, a PGA Tour right. event. Um, we're starting to see a little bit more of that, so that's great. Um, but th- it definitely, we definitely need more um, because it only helps us all as an industry. I can tell you on the social sustainability side, 
with diversity and inclusion initiatives, um, there has been a significant shift in working together um, coming out of the PGA Tour, the PGA of America, and the LPGA. The three commissioners of each of those entities got together last year in the fall and said, you know, we need to be sharing resources. We need to be helping each other to move the needle on the things that the industry is doing around DEI. And um, they created work groups to focus on six core areas that range from hiring, HR, and recruiting type uh, initiatives to um, recreational play and competitive play to things like um, supply chain, growing diversity and inclusion within a supply chain mm -hmm. for the industry. And um, even though those three commissioners are the ones who started this process, more organizations have become involved in that, including the USGA, the GCSAA, um, the NGCOA, and um, some others. And so there's some they, and they have really aggressive goals um, to implement really strong, kind of really moving the needle actions over the course of the next 12 months. Um, and I can tell you, you know, one of the groups I co-lead with a woman by the name Kara Davison from the PGA Tour um, is uh, around procurement and um, growing inclusion within the supply chain of the industry. And like, we are moving fast and furious to get things implemented. And we've already, you know, right out of the gate, uh, hit, two, hit two of our four goals that we had established for the year. Um, so, so the, we're really seeing some interplay between the associations from a social sustainability or DEI side. Um, we could do better on the environmental side. I think we still, yeah. we still aren't kind of getting that like cohesive. Right. Well, and, and it goes back to, you know, we're, we're making a choice by not doing anything. We're making the choice to be legislated into change rather than choosing to collaborate and make the changes before we're told to do so. And yeah. I would, I personally would sure rather have some influence and some impact on how those decisions are being made than not. But yeah, it, it's, it's, to, yeah no one wants to be on their heels, like trying to like no. fix things right. or like scramble to you know do something in order to prevent getting penalized in some way or having to wait an extraordinary amount of time for a permit to come through because some new piece of legislation came across, you know, so getting in front of it uh, makes a huge impact. For sure. So, okay. So let's, let's, uh, your segues are awesome. You're, <laughs> you're just feeding right into my notes here. This is perfect. So um, I know you've worked with, with Dr. Brian Horgan in the past, you, you've co uh, presented with him. And you're certainly familiar with his work on the impact, the positive impacts of golf in the community and, and golf courses as green spaces. Um, it, you know, to me, this is the, like, like you mentioned that the green roof initiatives and the, and the, you know, the, the, uh, the earth shattering news that, that green spaces are good for our communities, you know, wow, that, that, that's, you know, I'm glad I was sitting down for that, but I know. so, so, um, how do we, again, it goes back to communication within our communities, but, but how do we communicate what we all have known for a long time? That, you know, that it's a great place to hang out for 10 hours a day as, a, as an employee, but it's also a great place. And this probably, this probably has more impact on the public side than the private side. But, you know, I love what Brian's done and the research he's done and how he's packaged it and, and marketed it. And I'm sure you had an influence on that. So how do we get that out there? Okay. So, so I have to share a, a, a cute story about Brian. First of all, I, I love him. Uh, so Brian and I went to Michigan state together and when we were at Michigan state, he dated my best friend for a little bit. Um, and so we used to hang out all the time. We were friends at Michigan State. So what's funny is, you know, years go by and you lose touch with folks. And after we graduated, um, we stayed in touch for a couple of years, actually. Um, and then just kind of fell off the map a little bit and just hadn't talked in like a really long time. So I went to the Ryder Cup back 
um, when it was in um, uh, in Minneapolis, and um, went and toured um, the University of Minnesota kind of turf area where they do their their experiments, the field mm -hmm. and the course that they have there. And so I'm out there standing looking at the <laughs> plots, and this guy walks up in this windbreaker, and he looks at me, and I look at him, and he goes, "Wait a second, I know you." <laughs> Like, give what me are you doing here? I know. <laughs> and so it was really wild because we hadn't talked in like literally forever. Um, wow. But uh, yeah, really, really special, very cool. And then, you know, as we started talking, realized like we had so many shared interests and values and, and beliefs and like goals around um, sustainability and, and turf grass and golf and everything. So um, yeah, then we, we, ended up, you know, facilitating an education session at GIS together and we worked together and we continued to um, work on some things um, that, you know, really kind of help evolve and move forward the, the work that he has been um, knee deep in over the last several years with the research around the benefits around natural capital and the ecosystem services right. that golf courses provide. So that's just kind of a funny thing um, in terms of Dr. Horgan. But um, we, you know, some of the things that, and, and Brian and I talk about this, is um, first of all, the, the work that he has done with the modeling, um, which um, basically, and I think you're familiar with it, but just to a quick recap, it's looking at, you know, if you were to have a, golf, a space in, say, an urban environment where a golf course could be, what are the benefits and services that that course provides to the city and the community um, based on taking up that space in, a, in an urban environment? And right. then if you were to swap out that golf course for some other alternative use, like uh, commercial buildings, like a park, like um, a stadium, like housing developments, um, then what then becomes the benefits that each of those um, uses provides and they and they've measured it and they have a whole modeling program that does this which is just phenomenal yeah um, and that has been research funded by the USGA so um, so some of the things that he and I have talked about is okay where, where do you take it from there what are the next steps and, and what are you doing with it so and so before before you do that it is is the data to date is the research to date available on the usga's website is that where you'd find it if, if people want to know more about it so i don't think that they've published that it's basically a model that's going to be released around uh, the the model is open source to so okay. be able to like go in and plug in information and access and it'll come back with, you know, these are the differences that you would see. Okay. As far as the actual kind of overall results of the research, I don't think he's published that fully yet. I think right. May is when it's being fully completed. Okay. I know there's some, there's some on the University of Minnesota's website still. So I don't, I, I just, I didn't know if you had any updated information on that. I don't. No, he, so Brian, now that he's at Michigan State, he's yeah. still been the lead on the research. Um, they did add in Detroit as part of the study in the last uh, two years. Um, so that I think has been completed, but there, I don't believe that they fully released everything yet. I think it's May. Okay. Um, but, but the goal is to have this tool that is open source that you can go in and be able to plug in, you know, your data and be able to determine in a certain city, you know, what would happen with change of use and space in an urban environment. Um, but what he and I have talked about is, is just specifically like, how can you take um, the learnings from that and and make it use make it i mean it's obviously useful for a city planner or somebody that's evaluating a development in a community or a city um but also we've talked about like how do what are the tangibles that we can be communicating around what has been learned from right. this research and that is things like you know the benefits of um water filtration or pollinator habitat and um, reducing the heat island effect, which is a really big one. Um, and incidentally, we'll be sharing a little bit about that in our, we're going to be releasing within the next one to two weeks, the uh, Colorado Economic and Environmental Impact Report.
support for the entire state of Colorado. And we'll talk a little bit about that, that heat island effect in there um, in the Denver market, which is, you know, significant, has a significant heat island. And um, so how golf courses can help cool the environment. So um, anyway, how do you share that information and communicate it out? And the things that, um, that community engagement, I mean, from a bring it back to, because I know, you know, your listeners and viewers are um, a lot of superintendents, bring it back to the superintendent and what they can do, um, things around communication. You know, we talked about a newsletter earlier, you know, that kind of thing, right. or a member um, bulletin or blogs. I know a lot of superintendents do blogs. So incorporating some of those benefits into those blogs, um, but it also could be including things like a, uh, like an environmental um, stewardship or environmental tour of the facility. Um, I know some superintendents do like bird watching tours or wildlife tours, but like, something about, you know, talking about the benefits. It could be signage, you know, um, I know like the pollinator program that Syngenta sponsors, I've seen at some courses signage around, you know, the pollinator habitats. Um, in this case, there could just be signage that's educational, especially for a public course or municipal course around um, the different areas of things that are taking place and what the benefit to the community is. So like really simple things like that. Um, it could be uh, things like hosting, you know, one of the courses that we work with in Hawaii, Mauna Kea Resort, um, they have, um, they have a uh, be flow hives on their course and they have i think six of them now and so they um do produce the honey they bring it in they use it in their food and beverage department they actually will do a tour where folks can walk around um tour the course they'll talk about um what it beekeeping and then they talk about like how they take the honey and they then they they will have them sit down for a meal and they'll have like every course feature some aspect of honey and preparation and then even cocktails and stuff they'll craft cocktails they'll integrate it in there so it could be like working with the food and beverage department to um to share things like that um some courses have on-site gardens so same thing you know same like uh koaniki out in hawaii i know their their garden is for their members to be able to come and take um and, and utilize whatever they need out of the garden and then they use it for food and beverage in the food and beverage department as well um and then also there could be things like, I saw this one article I loved um, out in New York, some urban gardens like in the greater New York area had, um, they're, they're, they're doing different things on their garden. So whether it's like having kids come in and do field trips through the garden, which would be like a STEM program on a golf course, mm -hmm. or whether it is, um, giving, taking food that's grown in the garden, giving it to a local food bank, um, different things that they're doing at di like 15 different gardens in the greater New York area. They came together. They, this, this is they, non-golf, right? This non -golf, is non-golf, non-golf. Yeah. So these, these came together and they said, um, what are we each doing? Uh, are each of the 15, what are we doing to benefit the community? And then they created a press release around the 15. So it was like, rather than one doing it on their own, they did a press release about these urban gardens. They made a story around it. So I would love to see like an, an area with some golf courses, like doing something and it, and it doesn't have to be gardens. It'd be like totally different things, but like coming together and making a story around it, that's going to get some press coverage, right. you know? In, a, in an area, in a city, you know, or, or a region um, about all the things collectively that are being done. So, and that costs very, uh, like a nominal amount of money, you know, whatever, you know, maybe a marketing person from one of the courses volunteers to do it, or maybe somebody's hired to do it, but like, that's it. Otherwise it's just getting people's information together. Well, and, and, the, and the interesting thing is a lot of these publications and certainly uh, local newspapers are always looking for content. Yes. Yeah, and positive content. And it's and it's just a matter of again, it goes back to us tooting our collective horns and yeah. and, and our willingness or unwillingness to do so, I think is is kind of the stumbling block. Yes, definitely. But like you said, we're also we're also so focused on what we're doing every day that we don't think about the things that we do in the in the course of the day and how they would positively impact the community. So why would I talk about it if I'm not even thinking about it? <laughs> right. 
and so that that's a struggle right because we all we all struggle with time you know we only have so much time yeah. in the day and superintendents already have so many things on their plates and demands um putting out fires you know prepping like daily things um employee issues you know dealing with a member complaint or um request and so there's there's always demands on time so what you know, one of the things that I talk about um, in one of the talks that I do sometimes around um, kind of innovation in every day, um, one aspect of that that I talk about is um, it's moving the pieces. Um, so uh, I, it's the concept of, you know, who could I be engaging a partner perhaps that I can be engaging to help take something off my plate? And so it's not just delegation in the sense of like, what could I have my employees do? Although that's really important. I don't, and probably most of us haven't, it couldn't be better at that. I know I could, yeah. um, but the, um, the concept of like, maybe there are some things that partners could be doing that could help. So for example, and you probably hate me for saying this, but um, like if you're, um, if you're a supplier for a course and they need, they want to give a member update on some of the things that they're doing on the course. And there's a member newsletter that needs to go out asking for your guidance and your creative input and your help in crafting that, um, newsletter or, or that article for that newsletter um, gives is a win for you because it strengthens sure. your relationship. It gives your organization some exposure and it's a win for them because it takes a little work off their plate. And then that time that's freed from taking that off their plate should be spent and and, and really conscientiously and intentionally thought about like, how can I spend that time now to be doing something more? And then that could be some of this advocacy and communication efforts um, around things like the BMPs, whether it's internally with their members or whether it's in the community. Yeah, um, it's a great so, idea. Yeah, so there's, there's ways, it's just kind of thinking like strategically, like, how can I shift things a little bit to free up time? Because that will come back and be helpful yeah. for, the, for them individually and for the industry as a whole. Totally agree. Totally agree. Um, okay. So uh, this, this probably drills down more than, than what we've talked about already, but um, at Earthworks, we, we definitely focus a lot on, the health of the soils. Um, we're, we're, we have no idea what to do with this yet, but but the, the value of carbon sequestration, and I know Brian's work is, has touched on this a little bit, but it's a it's a big thing to get our heads around. Yeah. Um, but, you know, being, being who we are, that's a big part of uh, kind of our sales pitch as well, but, but also reducing inputs. So where does that fit into the to the story, number one, and and maybe what you do on the consulting side of things that that would that we could take and run with, I guess. Yeah. So um, you know, you talked to Brian the carbon the carbon balance in turf and that conversation. It's a tough one because you've really you know you you're. Um, You've also got the emissions that are happening on a course. So I mean, when we talk about carbon sequestration, it's real. You know, the, the grass um, helps sequester carbon, uh, but then at the same time, you've got emissions. So it's it's the conversation needs to be in totality. Um, there are we do carbon footprint modeling um, for some of the corporations we work with, um, and can do it for a golf course. It is not kind of our core focus area. Um, I know that um, at the University of Minnesota, or University of Wisconsin, um, there are some folks that do that that I have their information if anyone wanted it. But um, there's, um, I would suggest though, when we talk about carbon sequestration, that we're also looking at. Uh, what we're putting out as sure. well um, so that um, we can give a whole picture of that. But there is a real benefit and, and conversation to be had there for sure. So is that, is that something that you see on the horizon that, that we're going to need to be prepared for? Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Within the next four years, it will be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Well, Keep us posted <laughs> since we don't know how to get our heads around it. Hopefully somebody will figure it out. 
Um, okay, so so let's let's finish up with with. Uh, usually, I do a lightning round. I didn't prepare a lightning round for you, but um, I want to get from your perspective. As uh, you're not an outsider, but you're not an insider, so you're kind of a you're kind of a neutral party. Let's say. So, give me give me a couple of positives that you see on a regular basis that we're, we're not talking about. Yeah. You know, as far as what the industry contributes. I would say um, the, well, if, if we're getting really specific, um, I would say the, we, the green space in general, like, I don't know, I just said specific, but green space and then the benefits of the green space specifically. So, right. um, you know, f- filtering runoff. Um, I think that there's a huge ignorance, uh, a level of in- ignorance out there around um, the fact that golf courses actually filter pollutants. Um, I agree. And so I think that's a big one. I think, green, you know, and then when you talk about green space, that is the more general one, but you've got, you know, the wildlife habitat and pollinator habitat and then the cooling effects. So those, those four like kind of more specific things all roll under the green space. Uh, I think that is a tremendous um, ecosystem service, like, or benefit asset that golf is providing. And, you know, I would love to see that conversation being had at the state golf day levels, at the national golf day levels in the city, in meetings with um, regional organizations. Like for example, Texas has a lot of um, uh, kind of regional re- uh, uh, community regulatory bodies around water. Um, so there should be some conversations happening around that. Um, and then also, I think in general conservation efforts, because um, there are a lot of con- conservation efforts that are happening around water I and mean, golf uses a lot of water, but there's also a lot of conservation efforts that are happening around that. And, um, and then reclaim water, you know, as well. Um, and, and conservation around energy usage, conservation around uh, waste management. Um, again, in the Colorado report, you know, the environmental aspects, we, we share some of the data around um, waste management for Colorado and our golf course superintendents without this huge campaign or wave of we need to be recycling and like reducing our waste without even having that effort, they're doing the right things. They're actually like their numbers are great in Colorado around waste management. So um, talking about uh, what was that? Oh, we're not talking about. No, we're not. Well, and I don't even think that they, that they realize it necessarily. Right. That's right. Know? So, um, so I think you know, green space and conservation, and con- and then with green space and conservation, they both have legs underneath. You know, right. with specifics. Okay. So, conversely, what do we need to work on? Well, communication. communication. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Definitely like a big one. Um, And then I, and, and, and with that, you know, you hit on it with your question around um, collaboration. So, I mean, we, we have, we have a bigger voice and like have more of an impact when we work together. So when, when I see the, um, the Colorado golf coalition, which is the PGA, the CMA, the GCSA, and the um, state golf association working together on communications on the like like they're working together to this impact report but it, but they're also like thinking tactically like how are we executing once we right. have the impact report out like working together on communications working together like having summits together or, or conferences or meetings together um, and going together to things like state golf days um, that will make a big difference. Is is the disconnect, I don't want to get too far in the weeds on this question and just kind of popped into my head. Is the disconnect similar um, with your with your work in motorsports or, or are they more in lockstep with, with the entities within that within that industry? You know, they are the entities um, it has been separate. I mean, in recent years, there's there's been more that is happening together. But the the 
thing is though, you've got like NASCAR, the um, NASCAR is owned in IMSA or um, the sports car racing. They're owned by the same family, the France family. The um, IndyCar is now owned by the Penske organization. Um, Formula One is a separate entity. So there's a, been a little bit of, there is a little bit, it's a little smaller, I guess, um, but they are collaborating more together. And, and especially in the last year of the pandemic, there's been uh, a lot more collaboration and, and even in sports in general. Like I know um, there has been um, a, a really significant effort for leaders amongst sports across the board um, in the U.S. to work together around, um, you know, how are they handling things around the pandemic, like on, yeah. a, on a structured uh, regular basis. So, um, so I think like there seems to be a movement toward better collaboration in general, um, but it's more of course a little, little different in golf because there's a few less entities involved. I, I would think that uh, maybe, you know, we were talking before we came on the show about some of the effects of this virtual world we're living in now. And, and, you know, there's certainly some positives to be, to be drawn from it. Having an opportunity to do this, it wasn't something that we had on our radar a year ago. And I'm sure that collaboration maybe came about because these groups realized, gosh, we don't need to, you know, have some summit in New York city and spend jillions of dollars. We can just do it on a zoom conversation. Maybe, maybe that's, maybe that's a direction we can go that, that we can bridge some of these gaps. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, you know, the the Zoom Zoom has definitely and this and this virtual kind of interactive um, experience really has evolved us in many ways. You know, from just a phone call now you you can engage face to face. Right. Um, I mean, who would have thought? Do you remember like years ago, like on television shows and stuff when they'd show like this big screen and it was more like a sci-fi vision of yeah. you know, day you'll be able to see somebody. Right. <laughs> and, like <laughs> now it's just normal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we just exactly. canceled our um, regular conference call line like a month ago because we we're like, okay, we never use this anymore. Why? Why? That's right. That's right. Interesting. Yeah. So, um, last thoughts from you what what uh how how can we how can we get better how, how do we how do we improve our our place in the world as golf course superintendents as turf managers what what's your number one take home well let me just say let me just say you know i've worked in um I've worked in motorsports. Uh, I've worked in car rental um, and automotive kind of space um, before that media. And before that I was in a manufacturing uh, world. So the, 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 one of the things that's really special about the turf industry and hopefully superintendents, out, I think superintendents out there realize this is the tight knit community um, that exists. And, and like, and, Turf Twitter, you know, all of the great idea sharing um, and positive um, stories, you know, that can be shared. Um, I see that happening out there on the Twitter world um, between superintendents. Now, sometimes there are disagreements and stuff like that too, but just like any family, you have disagreements and sure. then you make up and then, you know, you move forward. Um, and that's a good learning. Um, so, what I would love to see is those like that kind of love, if you will, or that kind of sharing um, about the industry um, be conveyed like to a broader group because mm -hmm. in, in, in light and in around the things like the BMPs and the great benefits that a golf course can provide and the things that superintendents are doing um, every day around environmental stewardship. So I would just, I would say, you know, it's kind of been a theme of our conversation a little bit today, but like being ready and prepared for more proactive communication around um, the benefits that are happening on a golf course, right. you know, benefits for the community and the environment um, that are out there. Well, I think you, you definitely gave us some some good things to think about and and how to how to get the word out a little bit more readily in the community and and uh, and appreciate it. How do we get a hold of you if somebody wants to get a hold of you for your 
for you know for your professional services or 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 ask questions i know you've been very approachable for me and i really appreciate it um what, what's the best way to get a hold of you yeah just um so the link call anyone could call me um directly um my office line um is 248-609-9241 um if i'm not available in the office it does transfer to myself so usually i am pretty accessible and your and website I, what was that and your website and my website is radiosportsgroup.com and then uh twitter at gd rizzi g-d-r-i-z-z-i and then i'm on linkedin and i'm on instagram so cool. yeah pretty available nice no we we sure appreciate uh I know I appreciate your your communication within the industry, and I agree. I think it's a great tight knit group that maybe needs to spread their wings and and start talking to other groups. I, I noticed this weekend there was a, a, a professional golfer that had mentioned how how much she appreciated the chatter from from Turf Twitter and and yes, yeah, we need more of that. That that was that was really uh, that that made me feel pretty good that other people are kind of watching and seeing the passion that we all have for the industry and and we just we need to do more of that. So yeah, for sure, for sure. We have um, and just a little side note. I don't know if you caught Turf Busters two years ago at GIS. Um, we I had put together a, it was a half hour video um, and it was like MythBusters the movie, but or not the movie, the show, yeah. uh, and solving like kind of myths on, on a golf course. Um, we did that two years ago at GIS. We're hoping to do it again this next year at GIS. Um, before it was with Sean Rehorn and Dr. Mike Richardson, mm -hmm. uh, two new um, co-hosts uh, that will be involved this time. It's uh, Dr. Ben McGraw and Zach Bauer. Um, so that will be coming up hopefully next um February. Um, but in the meantime, the first one will be um, released this summer. So we had showed it at that GIS two years ago and then never officially released it because that, we're, that was going to happen last year, but the pandemic came down. Okay. Um, and so this summer, that will that first one will be released. Um, what's cool about that is, and it's not like it, we're not going to be on Netflix or something like that. <laughs> <yet>. Why not? <laughs> but, yeah, um, but what's cool about it is it makes... Um, what's happening on a golf course is like very relatable from a science perspective and okay. usually there's like two more sciencey myths and then one that's kind of lighthearted and fun so um that uh should be out this summer but like it, it does give good perspective around this you know the idea of you know there are great benefits that a golf course provides and let's share more about what's happening behind the scenes um, and, and what makes a golf course tick and, you know, all the benefits that, um, that a community can, can experience from it. So not on Netflix, but where will it be coming out through DC? So, it, through social media, you'll definitely okay. see it there. And then YouTube, um, uh, there'll, the video will be where it's housed or out, out of, out of radius or out of our association. No, it's out of radius. Out okay, of our, great. Out of, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. That's, that's good to know. Okay. Well, Gina, I really appreciate the time and, and I think you're doing great stuff and, and you know, we need more partners like you in the industry to, to get the word out and, and to really you know, paint us in the positive light that we all know that, that we should be. Um, uh, thank you again for the time, Gina Rizzi, uh, and you can find her at Radius Sports. Um, again, thanks for, for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel or, or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, thank you, Gina. Really appreciate the time. Thanks, Kevin. So much fun. Yeah, that was good. <laughs>